Greetings, I'm Eric from FIU in Washington, D.C. The most obvious reason that Washington, D.C. is a significant city is because it acts as the seat of our federal government. In this module, we begin with an overview of the federal government itself, the three branches in which laws are passed, carried out, and interpreted. This is a necessary foundation for understanding how other organizations in the city attempt to influence the government, as well as how you yourself can be involved in policy advocacy both as a active citizen, as well as potential careers where you can do so. In addition to helping you on your path towards Washington-based careers, one of the drivers of FIU in Washington, DC, and our Talent Lab program is to help you become an impactful advocate. They're actually made. The United States Congress is responsible for passing all federal laws, including the federal budget. It operates mostly on a two-party system. Most members are Republicans and Democrats, and also consists of two chambers, the House and Senate. For a bill to become a law, it must pass both the House, which has 435 members, here states with larger populations have more members, and the Senate, which just has 100 members, two per state. Two per state. The laws are then signed or vetoed by the President after they're passed by both the House and the Senate. The specific procedure of how these votes are cast and the number of votes needed for a bill to pass and become a law varies based on the situation and is a little complex. On the Canvas module that corresponds with this video, you'll find additional readings and videos that explain in detail how bills are introduced and voted on in both chambers of Congress, their committee structure, how congressional offices are staffed, and resources for tracking legislation under consideration right now so that you have a better understanding of how you yourself can know what's going on in Congress and communicate with your members of Congress as a citizen for maximum impact. Who are the members of Congress? We mentioned that each state has two senators elected by that state and that there are 435 members of the House of Representatives. Each of those members represent a congressional district we show here a, a snapshot of what some congressional districts are shaped like and in, in how they are numbered in Florida. For reference, Florida is represented by 29 individuals of Congress, 27 representatives, and two senators. While the delegation is mostly Republican, the Florida delegation is known to be collaborative and bipartisan on many key issues of importance to the state, including Everglades, trade, immigration, and education. The shape and size of congressional districts are redrawn every 10 years after the census, and it's based on the population of the state. That's because the U.S. Constitution requires that every congressional district within one state have roughly the same number of people. So in Florida, each congressional district has about 700,000 people, meaning each member of Congress represents about that many people. Interestingly, though, the districts are drawn based on the total population of the district not necessarily eligible voters. So in districts where some people might not be able to vote because of citizenship status or other reasons, they're still counted. In some districts might have more voters than others in that district. For most states, the districts are ultimately approved by elected officials in that state. And more often than not, these elected officials will draw these shapes of these districts so that it will favor the current political party which is in power in that state. This is referred to as gerrymandering. While the Supreme Court has ruled that intentionally drawing districts to reduce the voting power of a population based on race is illegal, the overall design of these districts is subjective in nature. In many states, including Florida, the specific shape of districts is determined by the state legislature. In some states, though, a separate nonpartisan commission is in charge. States have done this to attempt to reduce the biased influence of elected officials in drawing these uh, shapes. Staying informed on how your representative is voting and the overall policy stances they hold, as well as when they are up for re-election, is vital to ensure that you are prepared to determine the best candidate to represent your views in Washington. At the end of the day, we control who our elected officials are. Though, some factors like the design of congressional districts and other voting regulations, such as voter ID and early, avail early voting availability, can have an influence. Remember, even if you're not eligible, eligible to vote, you can advocate formally and informally by volunteering on campaigns 
having conversations with friends and family from your district, and overall helping people stay educated. The resources on Canvas for this slide have a lot more information about members of Congress and how you can be involved. To date, only two FIU alumni have been elected to Congress, but we know many more, even you, are destined to earn the title Member of Congress in the future. So what does Congress actually do? The members of the House and Senate are organized into over 200 committees and subcommittees, which review each piece of legislation that is proposed, which falls under their jurisdiction. It's under their jurisdiction depending on what kind of topic that, that bill uh, deals with. Standing committees are permanent panels that have legislative jurisdiction and an oversight role of specific federal agencies within their jurisdiction. For example, the Armed Services Committee in both chambers, both the House and Senate has an Armed Services Committee, have jurisdiction over the Department of Defense. Sometimes names can be tricky with the Senate Commerce Committee, for example, has oversight of the Departments of Commerce and Transportation, and even scientific agencies like the National Science Foundation fall under the Department of Commerce. Some other examples of committees in the House include the Committees on Agriculture, Education and Labor, and Small Business, for example. Most standing committees recommend funding levels or authorizations for government operations and for new and existing programs. In other words, Congress authorizing funding means that they are approving that amount being spent on those federal agencies and the federal programs in those agencies. On the Senate side, standing committees of jurisdiction have the power to confirm a president's choices for political appointees to lead federal agencies. So you might sometimes hear of Senate confirmations or a Senate confirmed position. Uh, when, they, when the president wants to appoint someone, uh, it is the Senate side of the Congress that gets to approve those. A full list of congressional committees is available in the resources area for this lesson in Canvas. Here are a few additional interesting points about committees. All of the committees are controlled by the majority party of that chamber, but has members from both parties. So for example, when Democrats control the House of Representatives, Democrats also control all of the committees in the House. This is not just informally by the fact that they have more members, it's actually structured this way. Practically what this means is that each committee in that chamber is chaired or led by a member of that majority party. The other party also plays a role. So the most senior member of the minority party on a particular committee is called the ranking member. Both the chair in the majority party and the ranking member in the minority party have their own separate staffs. Because of that, there are separate internship and job opportunities on those separate majority staffs that report to the chair and minority staffs that report to the ranking member. There are also often separate websites and separate social media channels for the minority and majority staff of a committee. Generally, policy experts make up these staffs of the committees. While it is not uncommon for cable news to cover live committee hearings on topics of great national interest, you've probably seen some uh, con congressional hearings covered on, on news networks, you can watch the hearings on the website of the appropriate committee. All of these hearings are, are streamed live and recorded. Our Florida delegation and members of Congress from our state hold key roles and leadership in committees ranking from education, labor, intelligence, military construction, veteran affairs, small business, and foreign affairs. It should be noted that as, it, as, that as FIU, as a major research university and one of the largest universities in the country, works closely with these members of Congress so that they may promote issues and legislation that fall within their jurisdiction and are also topics that FIU has uh, some expertise in. In other words, you should know that your state of Florida you're one of our many students that lives in the state and your university, FIU, play a role in these national issues at the congressional level. In addition to committees, which are a more formal uh, grouping of members of Congress, members of Congress also often join and are members of many caucuses. Caucus are, caucuses are more informal alliances of members of Congress based on any factor, including region or identity, for example, the Congressional Black Caucus or on specific topical interests, 
such as the Congressional Caucus on Foster Youth. By forming these alliances, members of Congress can be more effective in their advocacy and votes towards a specific piece of legislation and issue. The work of Congress takes place on Capitol Hill, also referred to very commonly as simply the Hill. You're likely familiar with the iconic domed Capitol building where floor debates and voting take place. But the Hill is a complex of buildings that surround the Capitol. A majority of these buildings are House or Senate office buildings where each member of Congress has their own office and staff. It is in these offices, not the Capitol building itself, where members work on legislation and hold meetings with their constituents and other interest groups. There are also several buildings of the Library of Congress. The titles and job descriptions of the staff of each congressional office is relatively consistent. Understanding these roles is helpful to picture the type of work that goes on in each office and the types of career opportunities available for you there. Each office is led by a chief of staff. Some of the other critical roles in a congressional office include legislative director, legislative assistants, press secretary, staff assistants, and a scheduler. The issues that each member of Congress has to be informed on vary from office to office. It is always good to be aware of what staff member is the lead on activities relating to the issue you are concerned about. A quick phone call to the office can get you that answer. Each member also maintains a district office in their home state where the staff is mostly focused on constituent casework or when residents from that district call and ask for help with some sort of federal issue less related to policy, such as questions about Medicare, Social Security, etc. More information on what each staff person in a congressional office does is available in the Canvas resources for this course. On average, a House member, member of Congress in the House, will have uh, teams of about 15 to 20 staff members split between Washington and their district offices back home, and senators can have upward or of 30 or 40 offices in their Washington, D.C. and state-based offices. Our discussion of congressional staff would be incomplete without mention of the outsized role that congressional interns play in a member's office. During any academic semester, an office could have between three and 10 congressional interns taking calls from constituents, preparing press briefings, and doing policy research. Thankfully, many congressional offices now offer a stipend to their interns. At any one time, over 50 FIU alumni in total work for Congress, even holding the top staff spot of chief of staff. And so can you one day, just as our Panthers on this slide have done. Congress passes hundreds of laws every year on a variety of matters, though one of its most important responsibilities is the federal budget process. The annual budget of the federal government begins with the executive branch of government, those are the federal agencies, that have their requests for their budget for that year. The president submits his or her own budget request, which takes into consideration the requests of those individual agencies and submits it to Congress. Although much time and energy are placed in analyzing this request and congressional hearings take place to understand the administration's priorities, that's the priorities of the president, the proposal from the president and the executive branch is just a suggestion. It is Congress that has the ultimate authority on how much money the federal government can spend each year and on what. For this reason, it is said that Congress has the power of the purse. That determination is always made not in one master budget bill, but in 12 distinct budget bills, each that attains to a particular subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. Let's talk about that one more time. The federal budget of our country every year is determined annually through 12 separate bills. Each of those separate bills are reviewed by a subgroup of the Appropriations Committee, which is the committee responsible for the budget process. This budget process is complicated. We don't get you, we expect you to get it after this one slide. I don't fully understand it myself without going back and, and reviewing some details uh, when I need to engage with it or talk about it. Yet it is important to know how tax dollars are spent and how it is decided what government programs will operate that year with what amount of money. Our Canvas resources provide much further reading on this subject.
Now that a budget and laws are in place from Congress, the executive branch takes over to implement and enforce the law. Have you ever thought about how many federal agencies exist? If you guessed or even Googled, nobody knows, you'd be right. While many Americans are familiar with some of the largest, most recognizable federal agencies, hundreds of smaller and specialized federal agencies carry out the mission of federal government, and there's no one complete or accurate list. There are, however, 15 cabinet level agencies whose leaders, known as secretaries, serve in the president's cabinet, which is the advisory board to the White House and also makes up the line of secession to the presidency. Some of these agencies are referenced here, such as education, health and human services, and housing and urban development. As mentioned previously, the Senate has the awesome power to confirm a president's political appointees in the administration. This is part of the balances of power. The president can't just put whomever he or she wants in these, in these posts. Um, they are subject to Senate review. Depends how aligned the Senate and the president are as to how many of those go through at any given time. In addition to 15 that serve on the cabinet, each president will ultimately decide over four thousand political appointees across the agency landscape. That alone keeps those committees of jurisdiction quite busy in reviewing and approving those nominees. Federal agencies play an important role in the policymaking process. While the executive branch carries out its work with the authorization and funding provided by Congress, the laws passed in the legislative branch are just a start, leaving most of the specifics to be decided and carried out by the appropriate federal agency through what is known as rulemaking. Federal agencies create or promulgate, to use the fancy term, federal regulations, also known as rules, that are more specific and enforceable. So let's break this down. Congress passes laws that are pretty broad. If the law is about education, it might then go to the Department of Education. If it's about health, it might go to the Department of Health and Human Services. Those agencies are the ones who actually develop the regulations or rules that will be enacted. So when you hear about we need more regulation or rest, less regulation, it's the agencies doing that, but they have to follow the guidelines of the laws passed by Congress. They cannot craft the regulations that in a way that goes against the law that Congress passed. According to the Congressional Research Service, which is part of Congress, Delegating authority to agencies can enable Congress itself to focus on bigger picture issues rather than spending its time and resources debating all of the technical details required to fully implement a complex public policy. However, the relationship between Congress and federal agencies can be a delicate one. Congress will always claim that agency officials are not directly accountable to the people. That's because they're not elected. Congress faces the possibility that agencies will issue rules in a manner that Congress views as inconsistent with their congressional intent. That's where the courts come in and discuss that in a second. Agencies must follow certain rules of their own when developing regulations. They can't just do whatever they want. In addition to following the intent of Congress to the best of their ability, they have to follow the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, which requires certain things, such as opening proposed rules for public comment. The policies of federal agencies can be challenged in Congress. Congress, if they don't agree with what an agency is doing, can pass new laws or defund the programs. Or the issue can go to review in the courts, which can rule that an agency overstep its authority given to it by Congress, or that the law itself that Congress passed was unconstitutional in the first place. Besides the cabinet level agencies, other executive agencies, known as independent agencies, vary in size and purpose, and the list of these agencies changes over time. Listed here are three lesser known federal agencies, a corporation for national community service, which administers volunteer programs such as AmeriCorps, the Export-Import Bank of the United States, which promotes exporting goods from American companies, and in fact, uh, FIU alumna currently works for what is possibly the smallest federal agency, the three employee Japan-US Friendship Commission. Now that we have 
covered, how federal laws are passed and implemented. We conclude with how they are challenged and interpreted after a dispute arises, and this is done through the federal court system. The federal court system is where the constitutionality of laws are challenged and resolved. Federal law can be challenged in court only once there's a specific case or controversy around a law. This means someone cannot just be like, I disagree with this law, I'm gonna take it to court. In most cases, a plaintiff has to have been directly harmed by the law. The first place that a lawsuit concerning a federal law would be heard is in a trial at the district court level. The district court level is the lowest level of the federal court system and cases are heard there by trial. There are 94 districts spread around the country. The result of the district court's ruling could be appealed to the geographically appropriate regional circuit. Here on the screen, we have the map of the 12 regions. Each one of those regions has a regional circuit court for appealing the initial decision by the smaller district trial courts. In the regional circuit, uh, the cases are not heard by a uh, trial, they are heard by a panel of judges. The third and final level to which the case can be appealed is the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. The Supreme Court is mostly not required to hear the case. However, in only a small percentage of cases that are appealed to the Supreme Court every year are heard by its nine justices. The court refusing to hear a case does not mean that it agrees with the lower court's decision. Cases decided by the Supreme Court often have a great national significance as the ruling is applied nationwide. While in Washington, do make it a point to visit the Supreme Court, still one of the branches of government whose regular proceedings are not broadcast live. In most levels of the federal court system, judges are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, similar to uh, in, the, in the executive branch, and they are entitled to serve for life or until they retire. And that concludes our introductory exploration of how laws are passed, implemented, and challenged across the three levels of the federal government. You may have reflected on how this all sounds relatively clean and sensible in comparison to the political chaos and drama that we see in the news every day. This introduction is meant to give you an understanding of the systems and processes on which the federal government operates so that you can better understand the rules by which political actors are playing, even when governing gets messy and divisive when it plays out in real life. A combination of continuing to learn how the government works and following the news of the priorities and actions of the current Congress and administration will help you be a more effective democratic participant. In our next module, we will explore how non-governmental agencies, including corporations, lobbyists, and citizen advocacy groups attempt to influence the public policy process that we learned about in this video. I'll see you there.